wind up suffering. It's a tough one and it's a hard one and it's way longer than you think it's going to be. I started suffering. I was 20 years old and I had a brother who lost a young wife. He had two small children left on his own. That was my first experience with real suffering. You know, when, when you're in your, your, young, your younger years, it's kind of boundless. Life is boundless. You have no idea what's on that horizon. And you think everything's going to be pretty darn good along the way. Um, I was married just a year later, and my father-in-law died suddenly, two months after we were married. Had a massive heart attack. No warning. Left my mother-in-law at 56 as a widow. And at 21, 22, I guess I was at the time, I didn't really get that kind of suffering because my life was boundless. Then as life went on, my mom died very suddenly when I was only 35. So that was my next sort of level of suffering. And now it's starting to take its toll. <laughs> it's getting a lot harder. Then six years later, I lost my dad. Then a few years later, I lost in a span of six years, I lost three brothers. Lots of trying to figure out what is this all about? How come some of us are hit so hard? But the hardest one happened four years ago when I lost my husband. He had had cancer at a young age. So it's not that we didn't live with cancer, but we didn't really snuggle up to it. He was 34 years in remission. So we, it's not something we, we really expected Anyway, he relapsed after 34 years and he managed to um, have some surgery and he got better. And two years later, he relapsed again. Ten days before that, my 31-year-old son-in-law had a massive seizure, which proved to be a malignant tumor. The worst kind of tumor you could probably have. So, as my husband was having treatments, my son-in-law was going in for surgery. Um, so where am I now after four years of processing that suffering? There are places where I've wondered, how will I possibly live on? I didn't think I'd actually survive five minutes without Vic, let alone four years. I really didn't think it was possible. But you know, there was kind of like grief, and grief is one of the worst sufferings. And there was me. And somewhere in the middle of that grief and suffering, there was a force that promised me I didn't have to do this on my own. And he dragged me through, along with a huge community of friends. Um, but still, I had to go through the trenches all on my own. And it's not easy work. It's hard. Along the way in this road of suffering, we all have questions because we don't really understand suffering. We really don't understand it. Just the other day, it was actually Mother's Day. We had gathered as a family and it had been our first time since COVID um, where we were able to really sort of sit with each other and chat and enjoy each other's company. And, and my son had said to my son-in-law, you know, I was just thinking about all our golfing time with dad and what fun we had and all the craziness we went through with that. Eh? And um, it was just like the best of times, right? And so I came home and a day or two later, I think it was on the Monday, I was doing my hair. I was thinking about it. I said, you know, God, this doesn't even make any sense. Like, what kind of plan is this anyway? Like how this, this, this guy, this 60 year old man who was so important in so many people's lives. He was so important in my son's life. He was so important in both my son-in-law's lives. And, and my husband was a big, big presence in their life. And I was just like, you know, God, that doesn't make sense. Why would you take, why would you take him? So how do you struggle with all those kind of things where you're like, yeah, come on, God, like this doesn't make any sense because we want answers. That's the one thing we want. We always want an answer to our pain and our suffering, right? And sometimes we ain't going to get it. So I, I still struggled with that. That's four years later and I'm still like, 
I still don't get it, God. And maybe I won't. Maybe I'll never get it. Probably not. And maybe when I enter glory, it won't even matter by that point. But when you're living here with it, you're going to struggle with it. And you're going to question God. But it's also going to be okay because he can take it. Trust me, he can take it. I haven't always been the most pleasant with him. <laughs> and he can take it. Welcome to week two of the My God Why course. Last week we opened up an introduction of what the problem of evil is. We introduced our series by saying God is good and blank happens. And if you remember, we said, you know, whatever you want to put in that blank, you can. Whether it's cancer, tsunamis, terrorist acts. God is good and that stuff happens in our world. And then we briefly looked at uh, the problem of evil. And the problem of evil can simply be put like this. If God is great, he must have the power to remove evil. And if God is good, he must want to remove evil. Therefore, evil must not exist, but evil does exist. And so really, we're now on the journey of wrestling with this problem of evil. To seek and explain, even if in part, why, why is it that there is evil in this world? Why is it that we have pain and suffering as a part of our existence? And today I hope that we will ultimately rediscover the beautiful Christ-like God. So, our topic today is a more Christ-like God. And we're going to be tackling this question of what is God like? Because honestly, before we can actually get into some of our wrestlings of my God, why? We actually need to know the kind of God we're talking to. The kind of God that we are talking about. Who is the my God to which we speak? You see, the way you envision God in your mind is probably the single most important fact about you. You see, your picture of God determines the quality of your relationship with God. How you imagine God determines how you feel, how you relate to God. So, for example, you picture God as an angry, almighty smiter. You'll likely feel lots of fear, but lack a lot of trust and love to that kind of God. If you picture God as uninterested in your life, you'll likely be uninterested in God. And if you picture God as impersonal, I mean, you're not likely going to make that God the central point of your life. How you picture God really matters. As Pastor Greg Boyd once said, the quality of our love for God can never outrun the beauty of the God we mentally envision. How we picture God has tremendous implications for how we wrestle with the problem of evil. Our picture of God ultimately is going to influence how we interpret the suffering and the evil in our lives. Our mental image of God will filter every answer of why that we could come up and supply to explain the existence of evil in this world. And so, what is God like? You know, there are many different responses to that question. And I want to set up our conversation today by looking at three common misconceptions about God as it relates to the problem of evil. We're going to look at these false images and understand what their explanation for the reason for evil, pain, and suffering is. And then we're going to close our time today by going through scripture and seeing how God is exactly like Jesus and how Jesus corrects our common misconceptions about who God is and why God allows evil. So here we go. Our first common false image of God is the deadbeat dad. God is the deadbeat dad. This misconception imagines God as someone who lacks faithfulness to his children. Like other deadbeat dads, God is said to mostly abandon his children in this world. A deadbeat dad rarely visits, rarely calls, and rarely ever shows up. A deadbeat dad doesn't provide for his children unless he has to, like being court ordered. So the deadbeat dad is, he's mostly apathetic to the life of his kids. In theological terms, we call this deism. In this view, the reason that there's 
evil, pain, and suffering in the world is because of the lack of love and faithfulness of God. God exists and he created the world, but it seems that this kind of God just kind of wound up the world and walked away and doesn't ever interfere or act within creation. Evil, pain, and suffering could be stopped, but this kind of God doesn't really care to do anything about it. Nor does God really understand what his kids go through in pain and suffering. The second misconception of God I want to tackle is this idea of God as a blueprint. In theological terms, we call this meticulous determinism. But a blueprint is a technical outline of exacting specification to which there can be no alteration. The term blueprint is most often used in engineering and architecture, and there's not supposed to be any margin for error. Like if you build a tower and your tower is off by an inch, by the time you get to the 90th floor, that's a big problem. The ultimate reason for everything is that the blueprint directly wills it to be so. It's all a part of the blueprint, the master plan, to which there's no deviation. Everything that has happened and everything that will happen is the result of a divine plan. Every car crash, every cancer cell, every kidnapping, every murder, every war, everything. The blueprint view suggests God ordains and brings about all that comes to pass, even evil. So in this view, the reason for why there's evil and pain and suffering in the world is because of the unalterable will of the blueprint. Evil exists because God, in this view, is the author and the cause of all things. God ordains and governs evil, pain, and suffering to bring glory to himself and cause us to fear him. Now, you may be wondering, like, people actually believe this? Well, here's just one example of a theological work from Vincent Chun, who says exactly this. He says, God controls everything that is and everything that happens. There's not one thing that happens that he is not actively decreed. Not even a single thought in the mind of man. Since this is true, it follows that God has decreed the existence of evil and not merely permitted it. So that is our second misconception. God is a blueprint. The third one and our final one that we'll tackle today is God as a prosecuting attorney. See, a prosecuting attorney is someone who makes the case against you in court. This is an image of God as someone who cannot wait to put you on trial before your failures. The prosecuting attorney delights in laying out all your sins, both the old ones and the new. And this false image of God only sees God as punitive, retributive, and consumed with anger towards sinners. The prosecuting attorney delights in handing out retribution, especially in the form of pain and suffering and evil. The reason in this false image of God of why there's evil, pain, and suffering in the world is that evil, pain, and suffering suffering happen because they're the result of deserved punishment. Calamity is the sign that God is trying to punish us or someone connected with us to show them or us a lesson. And so this view shows up all over the place. Like every time there's a natural disaster, just turn on your TV and wait for someone to proclaim that the reason that this is happening is because someone is to blame and the prosecuting God is distributing so-called justice. And definitely a far extreme of this is the Westboro Baptist Church. They often show up at the moment of every disaster and they'll proclaim that God is angry with people and that evil is explained by God punishing us. Now, granted, the Westboro Baptist Church is a really extreme example of this kind of distortion. But this prosecuting attorney view of God shows up in other subtle ways. Like I heard the story of a friend of mine, Jessica Kelly, who had reached out to a pastor she knew for help. You see, her four-year-old son, Henry, had been diagnosed with brain cancer. Jessica reached out 
to this pastor because she heard his church really believed in miracles, prayer, and healing. So she called him up one day, and in her phone call with this pastor, you know what, he prayed beautifully for her son, Henry. But as the prayer time came to a close, the pastor started opening up the conversation. He started to ask probing questions about her life. And then the phone conversation went towards a prosecuting attorney view of God. You see, the pastor began to suggest that the reason Henry had brain cancer was probably because of some sort of unconfessed sin. He went on to say that while the sin probably wasn't Henry's because, you know, he's four years old, it was probably his parents or even his grandparents. Jessica was completely devastated. She was devastated that that God might be like that. A God that wasn't full of grace and mercy, but a God that needed people to pay. And that was so earth shattering for her. And so those are three different false images and misconceptions of who God is. You may be able to think of some more. Now, I recognize that some of these conceptions may hold a grain of truth for you. Maybe they still pass as currency in your view of God. I don't know. But what we're going to address for the rest of our session here is that these distortions of God need to come into alignment with who we believe God is. So before we address each one of these distortions, we actually need to talk about what God is like. And this is one I want want to say to you, which is probably one of the most important things you'll ever hear about what God is like. And it's this, God is exactly like Jesus. This is to say that when we look at Jesus, we see the definitive, decisive and authoritative revelation of God's triune character. Archbishop Michael Ramsey put it like this. He said, God is Christ-like and in him there is no unchristlikeness at all. You see, it's not that Jesus is just the nicer, more relatable version of God. It's not that Jesus is just a piece of the puzzle of who God is. You know, we're supposed to kind of put that together. It's that Jesus is the supreme, the final, the definitive revelation of who God is. God looks like the face of Jesus. The writer of Hebrews puts it like this. He says, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Colossians, the Apostle Paul puts it like this there. He says, The sun is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. Now, this may not strike you as that revolutionary. For those of us who are Christians, you may get that Jesus is the Son of God. But what I think we don't always understand is that to say Jesus is the exact revelation of God means that every other revelation is not an exact revelation of God. It's not like everything is a puzzle that we put together and Jesus is part of the puzzle. No, Jesus is the puzzle. So for example, you may look around at creation and see a lot of good things that point us to God. Like the psalmist would say, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Definitely we can say that creation speaks of the need for a creator. That the vastness of the universe reminds us of our own fragility and finiteness. These are good things we can learn from creation. But we dare not say that creation perfectly reveals God. Or else we may mistakenly view every earthquake, every tsunami, and every virus as revealing something about God. You need to hear this today. God is not like an earthquake. God is not like a tsunami. God is not like a virus. God is like Jesus. To say Jesus is the exact revelation of God means every other revelation is not an exact revelation of God. And this is true for how we engage scripture. You see, we can often engage the Bible as a flat book where every part has 
equal revelatory value. Sometimes, you know, people can string together a series of verses and proof texts and end up with a distorted view of God. Our interpretations of the Bible are not the exact image of God. Jesus is. You see, the story of the Bible is the story of God working with people where they're at. God often accommodates to remain in covenant relationship with a sinful people. Knowing that God would actually come along later in Jesus and write a new covenant on our hearts. This is what we read in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. And at this point, we really need to look at this passage and say, okay, John, no one has seen God? Like, if you read your your Old Testament, you'll see, like, didn't Abraham see God? Didn't Moses see God? Didn't the 70 elders see God on top of Mount Sinai? But John tells us no one. And he's probably embellishing to make his point. And the point he's making is that the revelation of God in Christ is so definitive, so revelatory, that it's like no one has ever seen God. Jesus is what God has to say. Jesus is the final word. And this is why when we read the Old Testament, we don't throw it out. By no means. It's still revelatory. It's just that it's revelatory in the fact that it points to Jesus. And then as we learn more about Jesus, we read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus. Let me put it like this. If you're wondering what God is like, God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There never has been a time when God was not like Jesus. We haven't always known this. But now we do. So you may be thinking, if God is like Jesus, how does that correct our misconceptions of who God is? How does this help us with the problem of evil? And I think that's exactly the right question. Because I want to say that Jesus challenges every one of our misconceptions. Remember those three misconceptions we talked about earlier? Well, firstly, I want to see Jesus actually reveals that God is not a deadbeat dad. If you remember, the deadbeat dad abandons his children. He's removed from their pain. He doesn't really care. And evil happens because the deadbeat dad lacks true love and faithfulness to his children. I think Jesus, if we really take seriously that Jesus is the face of God, that he blows that idea out of the water. Jesus reveals that God is Emmanuel. God with us. God never leaves us. God never forsakes us. Jesus tells us that surely I am with you to the very end of age. God is with us in a world of pain and suffering. And unlike a deadbeat dad, God in Christ is not removed from our pain. God in Christ is fully acquainted with all of our pain. He fully, fully experiences the pain of this world in his own life. Jesus suffered with us and for us on the cross. Jesus teaches us that God is not absent, but he gets involved in a world of pain. And unlike a deadbeat dad, God does care for his children. In Jesus, we see that God, his outpour, sent his love into the world. For God so loved the world, he sent the Son. And he desires the best for us. He wants to liberate us from this world of pain and suffering. God sees our suffering, and in Jesus, we're reminded he's actually overwhelmed with compassion for us. In Jesus, God weeps over the grave of his friend Lazarus. And God, and thus God in Christ, weeps over every bit of creation gone into the shadow of death. God cares that you and I are in this world of pain and suffering. Unlike a deadbeat dad, you should know that God is actually doing something about pain and suffering in this world. Jesus shows us that God is not just passively standing by in the world, but he is acting in a world of sickness and pain and suffering. So we see when God shows up in the flesh, God in Christ heals the sick. Jesus confronts the powers of darkness. 
He tramples over death by death by being crucified, died, and buried. He rises again, announcing a new creation. And this Jesus will come again to set this broken world to rights. He will bring us back into a healed existence. All will be well, and all manner of things shall be well. So I submit to you that insofar that we see God perfectly revealed in Jesus, we know that evil is not the result of a lack of God's love and faithfulness. Well, Jesus also reveals that God is not a blueprint. If you remember, the blueprint analogy suggests that everything that happens is the result of a singular, defined, and designed will that can never deviate or change. Now, when we look at the life, teachings, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we never actually see the blueprint view affirmed or taught. Rather, it seems Jesus countless times in the Gospels illustrates to us perfectly that God's will can actually be resisted. That we have agency and consent. One example of this is in Luke 13, Jesus is set his face to Jerusalem, and this is what he says. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as hens gather together her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Now here we get the picture that Jesus, God in the flesh, he actually has a longing, he has a will for something to happen, and that's gather his people in. And Jesus, God in the flesh, desires something. But but they choose not to listen. Jesus laments and says, you were not willing. You see, God actually lets us choose our own way in this world. God is not a puppet master. God actually was consents to our rejection of God's perfect will for us. And I think this is exactly the implication of something like the Lord's Prayer. If you remember when Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray, he tells them to pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. This suggests to me that earth is not perfectly representative of God's rule and reign. There actually is work to be done. Heaven needs to invade earth. We need to be about the business of bringing about God's will on this earth. I also want you to notice, like, as you read the Gospels, do you ever see Jesus walk up to a person and say, you know, I'd like to heal you, but it's God's will that you are this way. No. Rather, Jesus teaches us that God's will is revealed in the healing of sickness. Jesus never attributes evil and sickness or suffering to God, not once in the Gospels. In fact, what we read in the Gospels is that Jesus attributes evil to other wills like Satan. Like Jesus tells this parable, the parable of the weeds and the wheat. This is what we find in Matthew verse 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seeds in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. Here Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of heaven. This is the rule and reign of God. This is the will of God is the kingdom of heaven. And the wheat is representative of the good seed, the goodness God intends for creation. Then in this parable, we have weeds, which are representative of corruption, evil in this world. And notice that in this parable, Jesus doesn't explain the weeds is coming from God. He says an enemy has done this. Jesus has a spiritual warfare view of what's happening in this world. Just as the idea of a farmer going out and sowing weeds in his own field kind of sounds ridiculous, I submit to you that saying God causes and ordains evil is just as problematic. Greg Boyd puts it like this in his book, Is God to Blame? 
He says, in contrast to the blueprint worldview, Jesus reveals that we shouldn't accept infirmities and other tragedies as coming from the Father's hand. In faith, we should resist such things as coming from wills other than God. Lastly, Jesus reveals that God is not like a prosecuting attorney. The prosecuting attorney delights in causing calamity for just punishments for sins. Evil happens in this view because God is inflicting punishment. And you might ask, how does Jesus correct this misunderstanding? Well, there's two examples from the gospel I want to show you. First is found in John 9. This is what we read. As he, Jesus, went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So here in this few verses, we see that the disciples are actually projecting a sort of prosecuting attorney view of God towards this blind man. They assume that evil, pain, and suffering must be the result of divine punishment to sinners. And so in their worldview, they ask Jesus, well, who sinned? Who sinned? That's their question. This man or his parents? And notice Jesus' reply. This is what we read in the next verse. You're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There's no such cause and effect here. Look instead for what God can do. So Jesus does not validate the disciples' assumptions that sickness is the result of divine punishment. And then Jesus reveals what God would do, namely that the man born blind would be healed. So instead of asking who sinned, we actually need to be asking broader questions like how can God's will come on earth as it is in heaven? I think that better captures the ministry of Jesus. Could you ever imagine Jesus inflicting pain and suffering on a person? Could you ever imagine Jesus walking up and cursing people and giving people sickness? Could you ever imagine Jesus willfully causing pain and suffering? If you can't imagine that of Jesus, why do we somehow think that God the Father is different than the exact likeness of Jesus. And so my call to us is we need to look at Jesus dying for sinners to redeem us and God's creation, to get a glimpse of what God's attitude is for us. We see there on the cross that God wants to save sinners. He wants to rescue us from this fallen world. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So my friends, my prayer for you is that during this session today, you caught a glimpse of the beautiful God revealed in Jesus. My prayer is that today, that you've been able to correct some false images of how you think, some false images of what you think God is like. God is not like a deadbeat dad who lacks faithfulness and love to his children. God is not a blueprint who coldly ordains every act of evil. God is not a prosecuting attorney who delights in hurling pain and suffering towards the world. You should know this. God is like Jesus. God has always been exactly like Jesus. There's never been a time when God was not exactly like Jesus. We haven't always known what God is like, but now we do. Amen. So let me pray for you. God of mercy and healing, you hear the cries of those in need. You receive the petitions of your people and all who are troubled. May we know the peace and comforts and courage you offer us. Help us, God, to see your glory revealed in your Son, Jesus. Help us as we continue to wrestle with our questions. And remind us, Lord, that you never leave us or forsake us. Amen.